Welcome to Flat, Cool, and Acid Free, an OK State Archives podcast, bringing you stories about Oklahoma State University and Oklahoma. I'm Nina Thornton, multimedia producer for the OSU Libraries. On this episode, digital storytelling intern Libby Whitlow and the head of OSU Archives, David Peters, discuss how the history of Oklahoma State University has been recorded and some of the challenges of archiving that material. It seems appropriate to be in the archives offices for our live today as we will be discussing the complexities of recording and communication. Humans seem to have this need to record what they or others have done and are desperate to preserve memories in their lives. So let's start off with the first question. We've had a lot of OSU history recorded throughout the years. What is the first recording of OSU history? So the first document that I'm aware of or documents were the uh, deed uh, land deeds from the four homesteaders who provided the original 200 acres, either through donation or sale uh, to establish the college. That was in November of 1891. Uh, so those, those four deeds, uh, turning that property over to create the campus is, uh, is the earliest documents I'm aware of. And what are some other methods OSU has used to record its history? So, um, you know, initially most records are kept on paper. And so like the first faculty meetings, we have the minutes, you know, from those faculty meetings. Um, uh, the early uh, agriculture experiment station publications, the bulletins, you know, were printed out and distributed throughout the state. And so we have, you know, those records. Um, so mostly things are on paper. The, the, I think most, some of the most valuable documents or records we have early on are photographs. You know, the photographic record uh, can tell you a lot about uh, the, how people dressed, uh, the relationships of, of objects to one another, the different organizations that were on campus. Uh, and so those are kind of significant ways early on. And then our first campus newspapers uh, are developed. I think the first ones is published in 1895. You know, so we have those records too. So, you know, people are, are beginning to record uh, and then share this information through a variety of different formats. So initially, though, it's, it's mostly paper. So something new that you have in your office as of late is your sound scriber. Can you explain how this works and what it was used for? So um, audio, uh, we, don't, we have very little audio from, from early campus. Um, and we can talk a little about that, some of the things we do have in a little bit. But, but uh, in 1947, B.B. Uh, Chapman was a history faculty member here and he purchased a sound scriber. And a sound scriber was an earlier, an early um, mechanism for recording sound. Um, and so BB purchased this, I think it was the summer of 1947, and he uses this then to record uh, things like uh, baccalaureate services, commencement services. Um, uh, the, a, there was an annual uh, athletic banquet at the beginning of the year. Uh, freshman orientation, uh, he, would, he would go and record uh, those uh, sessions um, on his little on these little discs, uh, he also recorded uh, speakers who would come to campus, uh, and then he recorded it. He used it to record uh, interviews with personalities, and we can talk more about that also. Uh, but the soundscriber uh, is is it's a very kind of um, I don't want to say primitive, but but it's a, it's very basic, um, and so it worked off electricity. Uh, there was a, a microphone. Uh, that you could either hold or he would he would mount it, and so people could speak into the microphone, uh, and then the sound was was transferred to one of the two uh, styluses, and so one was set to re actually record on this very soft uh, vinyl disc, uh, and so one would record it, and each side could hold about 15 minutes of sound, and then when you wanted to play back, you put the other one down then to play uh, those sounds back and listen uh, to them. Initially, the soundscriber was developed mostly for like um, uh, work in an office, and so uh, someone would would uh, read it, read off a response to a letter, and then their clerical staff then would play it back and, and you know and type it up. Um, and so it was a way of recording uh, letters and those kinds of things. Uh, uh, and so they really weren't designed to be played back very often. In fact, the quality deteriorated fairly quickly. Uh, the good thing about the, the discs that we got from B.B. Chapman is very few of them were played, at least they weren't played very often, because eventually we were able to then save that uh, information. But he recorded all kinds of things uh, on these discs. Uh, and then uh, later on in his career, in fact, I think it was in the 80s, 
Um, he gave his disc to uh, the archives, along with some other material, uh, and eventually got his soundscriber. Uh, and so, uh, but it's, it's, it's a it's a, a tool that's now over, golly, like 70 years old. Um, I haven't tried ever to record it. I'm afraid to plug it in. I'm afraid that the tubes would blow. But uh, it was an interesting way of recording sound at a variety of different events um, for a period from about 1947. I think the last recordings we have are from 56. So almost a 10-year period where we have a variety of things that BB recorded. And you mentioned you can only get... 15 minutes on one side. It's amazing how far we've come. <laughs> well, and that was part of the problem, too, is if someone was talking for an hour, you'd have to take the one disc off, you usually put another disc on, and then, and then the reverse. Anyway, sometimes figuring out the order of, of how things are recorded is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I noticed, like, when they had the dedication of the Student Union building, which he recorded, um, the, the discs and the sides are just all mixed up. Uh, but with once we digitize them, we were able to kind of resort and, and get it in back in order. So. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned B.B. Chapman using it, mm -hmm. and uh, he used the Soundscriber to conduct a variety of interviews and met a lot of different personalities in the process. So expand a little bit more about some of his work and his story while, always, while at OSU. So um, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So um, uh, B.B. Chapman arrives here in, in 1927. He had his master's degree from Harvard. Uh, and so he starts on the history faculty here. He's only here for about three years initially. Then he heads off to Wisconsin, eventually gets his PhD, and then 10 years later, in, in 1940, 41, he returns to, to OAMC, Oklahoma Agricultural Mechanical College. Um, BB is an individual who, um, he's kind of a, a promoter, sometimes a self-promoter, but he's a promoter of history. Uh, and he wants his students to engage, if, if possible, in practical uh, uh, hands-on, um, uh, first-hand experiences. And so he invites speakers to come to his classes. Uh, he has his classes do projects where they go out and, and do things, uh, whether it's creating uh, memorials uh, or, or dedication markers at various historic sites. Uh, he has them work with the Payne County Historical Society. He has them work with the Oklahoma Historical Society. So he has, he has students actually physically doing things related to history. Um, one of the things he does is he invites speakers to come into his class. And so he, we have interviews uh, with B.B. Chapman uh, with uh, uh, Frank Eaton, uh, Pistol Pete. Uh, Frank came for a number of years to B.B.'s classes. And one year, he recorded Frank on the Soundscriber. Uh, so we have that. Um, he also interviewed uh, individuals like uh, former Governor uh, Henry Johnston. Uh, Johnston was the second governor of Oklahoma to be uh, impeached. Uh, he re had retired in Perry, Oklahoma, not far from Stillwater, uh, and B.B. In uh, interviewed him. Uh, B.B. also interviewed uh, William H. Murray, uh, Alpha, Alpha Alpha Bill. And, and Murray goes on this long diatribe. It's, it's one of the longest sets of discs. I think it's eight or nine discs. Murray just is a talker. Uh, and B.B. didn't really ask him that many questions. He would just get on these, these rolls of, of talking about stuff. Um, one of the most interesting interviews I think that B.B. Uh, participated in we interviewed uh, Roscoe Dungy. Uh, Roscoe was the editor of the Black Dispatch, uh, which was the African-American newspaper, really for, for central Oklahoma, um, but distributed uh, throughout the nation. Um, and uh, Roscoe Dungy was uh, intimately involved with the admission of the first African-American students to Oklahoma colleges. You know, we were segregated in, all the way through into the early 50s. Um, but Roscoe Dungy had been actively involved uh, in recruiting uh, students to consider grad or consider applying for like law school or professional schools. Um, I had to work with people like Thurgood Marshall, who was a lawyer for the NAACP, uh, and so uh, it's a really a, a, an insightful um, interview with Roscoe Dungy. Just a few years after the first uh, student um, Ada, Scipio, Ada Scipio was in, um, admitted to OU, and then our first uh, African American students here also in. The, late 1940s, early 50s. So um, anyway, just a variety of people that but both um, BB captured doing presentations or interviews with them. I think that really illustrates the value of recording and communication and kind of being able to see society progress because of it. Yeah. And, and one of the challenges, of course, is, is BB wasn't really a trained oral historian. And so many of, of um, well, 
they would use different uh, techniques or, or, or procedures, policies now. So like he didn't get permissions from anybody. He just assumed that they knew he was recording them because they had the machine right there. But there's things that, you know, we now look back and we wish, oh, I wish he'd done that. But at the time, he was really kind of ahead of schedule uh, in reaching out and trying to record people. And he'd been interviewing people, you know, for years. He just recorded things, you know, manually by hand. Uh, this allowed him to actually capture the essence of what they were saying and then play it back and make sure he had accurate quotations from them. So, useful tool for him. Yeah, I'm sure oral historians now are glad they don't have to keep track of the disc sides. <laughs> well, Bonnie has a question for us today. She met, She said that we mentioned diaries. Um, could David tell us a bit about the kinds of diaries held by the archives? Are there many? What kinds of personal records like diaries are the archives interested in collecting? So, you know, diaries provide, you know, firsthand information about, about individuals and, and their experiences in life, um, both the good and the bad. Um, our most uh, extensive set of diaries from one individual is Ange DeBeau. We have her diaries beginning when she was a small uh, child, I think 10 or 11 is her first diaries, uh, until she's 90 years old. Now, we don't, we don't have every year. There was, she had gaps in when she kept a diary, but that's a really a, a cumulative uh, look at her her self-examination of her life. And so Angie DeBeau is, is the most extensive diary we have. But then we have a diary from um, the Civil War, uh, um, uh, uh, someone at home uh, waiting for her husband uh, to return. And so we have we have that diary um, recording her experiences. We, we have uh, just a variety of, uh, well, lately uh, I worked with several uh, faculty members on COVID diaries, um, some students who, um, were asked if they would like to keep a, a diary during the COVID situation, which is still ongoing. Um, but uh, at the end of the semester, then uh, they could submit those diaries to us. And so uh, they really add another dimension to us understanding what people are going through uh, and they're a very val valuable tool. And so, yeah, we have a variety of diaries that cover a variety of different time periods. And we're very appreciative of that. Um, uh, and also, well, I think we have other, other diaries related to uh, people's war experience. Uh, Vietnam uh, and other other uh, conflicts we've been engaged with, and those those are I think especially uh, meaningful because we're talking about life and death. So, so what are some challenges to recording material? So you know, once material is recorded, then how do you how do you preserve it um, and and keep it in condition that you're able to access it? You know, a, a picture. You know, I I can if it's kept in a, a stable environment. I can hold that picture, I can look at it, I can see what's going on. A challenge um, is uh, a digital file. How do I look at a digital file? I have to have a piece of equipment of some kind, a phone, a something that can read that image. Uh, and so how we're gonna preserve those files is gonna be a different challenge for us than how we preserve that original picture. Um, and, and that's true with a lot of different formats. Um, you know, we, we've had, um, well, we had uh, uh, audio uh, recording, well, actually um, vi video, it was movie uh, film that was done in the 1917s. It was a silent movie crew came on campus. They were recording campus for the newsreels, which were used to be used in movies. You go to a movie and they show these little newsreels. Um, and uh, so they'd come to campus, had recorded that. Uh, we received a copy of that, um, but then it was placed in a, in a closet that later flooded. So we don't have that anymore. Um, in fact, we have, we have nothing before the 1930s. Um, in our earliest film, um, actually some of it's fairly stable, but is, is mostly of, of the football team. Uh, we, have, we have football film from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, we have the band uh, from the, the 40s and 50s. Um, and these are all things that um, with age, uh, they become more and more difficult to retain. Uh, and so when possible, we try to convert them to digital if possible um, <clears throat> because things have been destroyed. Uh, another example, you know, many of our early paper records that we had, uh, there was a, a very, very significant fire in Morrill Hall in August of 1914. So the first 25 years of our campus history were stored in Morrill Hall. And with the fire there, that it was the administration building at the time, you know, we lose all those records. And so no matter whether it's old and paper <coughs> material or, or more current files kinds of things, um, you know, how are you going to transition that material into the future? You have to think, now you have to think about software, uh, the equipment to, to play that software. Um, and going forward, you know, if we're designing things in different ways, you know, how are we going to manage that going into the future? 
So anyway, a variety of challenges. Um, it's amazing that things survive, uh, but a lot of things do, and we have ways of doing that. So. And Nina would like to ask us today, can you think of one item in the archives that you can't digitize because the media is too outdated? Uh, yes, we have some 12-inch floppy disks. So I don't know if, if people your age even know what a floppy disk is, but it's kind of like this in a way. And there were 12-inch floppy disks. And it's how It was an early method of recording data. And so we have some of those, and we have no equipment to play that. And if you have nothing to play it, then you can't transfer that data. And I have no idea whether that data is worthwhile or not. It may be the most miraculous thing ever created, or it may just be junk. I don't know because I can't, I can't get to it. Um, and we're and there's more and more formats like that. Uh, eight track. We still have an, I have an eight track player at home, so I can still play eight tracks. Uh, our oral history folks, um, uh, have some equipment that they can play like cassettes and those kinds of things, cassette tapes, uh, and reel to reel tapes. But yeah, there's more and more, uh, things from the forties, fifties, and sixties where the equipment is just hard to find. And so that format then is hard to preserve and move into digital. Yeah, and it's strange to bring up, you know, again, you mentioned it's hard to know what kind of technology, you know, people are going to have in the future. I mean, I'm sitting here right now and I can't fathom people not having a USB drive, but you never know. Yeah, and 50, 50 years ago, they couldn't imagine somebody not having a cassette, cassette player. So yeah. anyway. And Bonnie wanted to add to the show today that she has a scrapbook from her college roommate that she that was made for her for graduation. So, we love having OSU collectibles and memories and things like that. And we have quite a few OSU scrapbooks. And in the 20s and 30s, there was almost a, a scrapbook, scrapbook uh, planner uh, that they give, gave to students. And so it allowed them to record when they went to events, whether athletic events or dances. It gave them places to put in um, like dance cards and, and pictures and, and clippings from newspapers. And so they... They kind of gave them this this format for a scrapbook, and we have some of those too. So I think scrapbooks are interesting and to see what people keep. So fun. Now they just give us planners <laughs> or mortarboard. <laughs> so what are some different methods of recording that we use today, and why do you think it's important to continue the act of preservation? So, you know, we're still recording on paper. Um, you see very few photographs on paper, though. Mo almost all photographs are now digital. Uh, and so, but, but we still record images uh, through, through digital. There's more, of course, video and audio that's all digital, uh, and, and that's produced in a variety of different formats. So we have to be mindful of how we're going to keep those formats alive and, and transfer them to newer formats. One thing that intrigues me is, is a, lot, a lot of work is now being done in three-dimensional, like design, or, or three-dimensional space. <clears throat> and so how do we preserve those files that only exist you know, digitally, and yet the represent, representation of a three-dimensional object or event or, or occasion or a person. Um, and so how do you, and those can be huge files. Uh, and so how are we going to manage those kinds of files uh, going forward? Uh, but, you know, things are still recorded, um, audio, visual, paper, um, in a variety of different ways, uh, the human. Uh, you know, we also, you know, I, I didn't mention this, but I should have, you know, not all societies record on paper. Some memories are recorded like in dance or in song um, or in poetry or, you know, in, by memory. Um, and so there's a variety of ways that the societies and cultures retain memory from the past. Uh, and, and a lot of those are still used today, you know, teaching children little songs, you know, when they're learning their alphabet or learning their numbers. Um, so, you know, a variety of different methods are used for, for recording memory or keeping memory. And Lauren would like to ask, um, kind of going back to what you were talking about, as more records are now made digital to begin with, um, what will that mean for the future of archive departments? Well, we'll, we'll need to adapt. Uh, you know, in the past we talked about so many shelf feet of material that we were retaining. You know, now we're talking about terabytes of material that we're retaining. You know, and th for things that have bo were born digital and have only existed in digital uh, as a digital item. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned about the format it's in, um, uh, the original recording or, or resolution, you know, was, was the photograph a very low resolution so it's going to be very grainy or was it a high resolution or was the recording 
you know, a very dense um, quality recording or not. It's just, it's just going to be interesting how we, you know, transfer that going forward as new formats develop um, and how we convert these older formats to usable formats in the future. Yeah, so many things are being digitized and there are also, you know, mentioned dances and more non-traditional ways of recording that it's hopefully one day we'll be able to get to a point where all of these mediums are at the same playing ground, the same level, so that everyone can have a chance to kind of share their story and their history. Yeah. It's interesting playground where we're in right now with the digital world. This segment was part of the Archives Live, a monthly video broadcast on the Archives Facebook page. Join us there to ask questions, share your stories, and see photos from the OSU archival collections. The music is It's a Process, composed by Ben Stone and Finley Green and published by BBC Production Music, PRS. From the folks at Oklahoma State University Libraries and the Archives, thanks for listening. And always remember to keep your archival material flat, cool, and acid-free. <laughs>